Hi, welcome to Winsight Live. I'm John Springer of Winsight Grocery Business. I'm here this week uh, with Kat Martin, our content director, Jen Straley, our senior editor, uh, special guest this week, Brett Dworsky of our sister publication, Convenience Store Petroleum is here. He's gonna offer us some perspective on food service as the convenience store industry gets going again. And as always with us is Phil Lempert. Phil, um, we careened from one crisis to another here in uh, America in 2020. Uh, your thoughts from out in Santa Monica? Well, yeah, as you know, John, uh, Santa Monica has been hit pretty hard and, and nowhere in the 25 years I've lived here would I ever have thought that we'd see, you know, uh, army tanks on the streets or National Guard tanks on the streets of Santa Monica and, and on Venice. Uh, but that's the reality. But what I want to do first is welcome Brett as, as a contributor uh, to us. Um, and also I want to, with Jen's permission, I know, you know, she's in charge of good news, but I want to start off with good news because we've had so much bad news. Uh, so Stephanie Myers, who's an RD um, and uh, is at Boston University, wrote an interesting piece about five ways eating in a pandemic is improving your relationship with food and why you should stick with them. Um, I'm just going to list all five. Eating family meals together, kids learning to cook, as we've talked about a lot, eating more plant-based proteins, buying food locally and lending a hand in the hunger crisis, and changing mindsets about wellness to include self-compassion. So I think that you know that's a, a good way to start where we have all this terrible news. Um, also, CNBC has reported, as we have as well on Winsight, that major retailers across the country are temporarily closing their stores in the areas hit hard with protests against police violence. We've seen, you know, emails coming out from just about every retailer shortening hours or, or closing stores. I'd uh, love to get some of your input on that. But before we do that, uh, there is a free tool uh, that's available for retailers, C stores, as well as supermarkets. It comes from Roebling's store reopening analytics. Uh, it maps retailer store locations against up-to-date COVID-19 metrics from the John Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center and other sources. It includes local case and fatality counts, local case and fatality trajectories, and state government mitigations and restrictions currently in place. So check it out if you're thinking about opening up your store or have, and now you've reclosed it. It's Roebling, R-O-B-L-I-N-G dot com, and it's a, a free tool for retailers. So what do you all think about these store closures, these temporary store closures and, and the changing of store hours? Um, Kat, why don't you get us started? You're, you're in the heart of it as, as uh, am I, uh, you're in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. so um, I don't live downtown. I live kind of outside of downtown. I'm still in the city. Um, you know, my immediate area has been spared. I know Brett and I live in neighboring uh, communities um, and we've seen, you know, tagging and spray painting, um, things like that. And I think he might have, he's in uh, Logan Square, which was one of the, the neighborhoods hit. Um, and it's just, it, it's, it's one of these situations where I, I just really kind of don't know how to feel. Um, you know, everything is, is just a mess and I, and I don't know what to do and I don't know, um, you know, even how retailers can handle this, they're having to address it both physically with their stores and also having to deal with, you know, their employees who are being directly impacted by this. So I think it's, it's just, you know, a situation where um, there are no winners and I don't know how, how they can, you know, navigate through this. Brett, you know, you're in the midst of it as well. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, just to, I mean, really just to echo what, what Kat was saying, um, it's, it's really sad more than anything we're seeing happening everywhere. Um, I was at where I am at, you know, there's been some peaceful protests going on, which is, which is good. Um, but in terms of the store closings, yeah, I, I haven't seen any, any looting nearby me. Um, there's a, there's a little bodega across the street from where I live that we always stop into for really anything we need. And that's been completely closed the last couple of days. Uh, Usually open to about one in the morning or so, um, not even open at all. So uh, yeah, it's just really tough to see all these retailers closing, and also you know 
mom and pop shops in the areas too that this is their livelihood and, and now they're closing up. Um, this stuff to see, really difficult to put into words, try, you know, talking about how to move forward. Uh, it's, it's a tough time. And Jen, what, what about in Denver? What's going on there? Yeah, you know, I, I kind of took a break from the news on Saturday, so I didn't watch or read anything. I just needed a, you know, mental break, went out for a big, long walk and, you know, did some other things. And then we went to go pick up food at like seven o'clock. We went to the local Safeway and there was someone standing out in front of the store saying, oh, I'm sorry, but, you know, we, we actually have to close because there's an eight o'clock curfew. And I was like, what? <laughs> I, I didn't know that. Um, and it's so it's really it's it's just heartbreaking that you know retailers have been struggling uh, particularly ones that you know haven't been able to be open like like a macy's in new york um new york city getting smashed and um boy when when this is when all of this when we're through all of this retailers are going to have some some real crisis training <laughs> and, and before i go to you john in in new york which is probably hit among the most uh the most difficult um you know what i want to do is is put up a, a photo of um of a whole foods in brentwood california uh which is near us um amy goldsmith from our team uh took this picture yesterday and um, this is what Whole Foods did in preparation in Brentwood, which is one of the wealthiest areas of Los Angeles County, um, just to just to you know prepare for what's going on. You know, you talk about um, your, you know, your curfew, if you would, uh, Jen, at, at eight o'clock, uh, Santa Monica for the past two days. Our curfew has been at 1:30 in the afternoon. 1.30 in the afternoon by the beach. John, what's going on in New York? Well, you know, the city that never sleeps is uh, <laughs> is also taking a curfew. You, you know, it's just extraordinary. I mean, my, my reaction is, you know, I, I can't help but tie it to the, the extraordinary circumstances that we've been talking about here for the last two months with the economy being shut down, uh, you know, uh, essential workers kind of rising to the fore, but along with an undercurrent of the fact that uh, they're not getting paid enough or this feeling that they ought to be paid more. Um, you, you know, I wouldn't doubt that, you know, part of the difficulty for the retailers to address this is that probably no small numbers of their employees are out there um, on their off hours uh, demonstrating and, and speaking out, and as well they should. I mean, the, the core... Um, you know, issues that are sort of behind the, the whole eruption of this feeling is, you know, it tightly tied to social justice. And, and, you know, I think all of us can agree that is just, you know, gone wrong in so many cases in the U.S. And uh, so, listen, uh, I was out uh, riding my bicycle around the city on Saturday. I came across three or four different protests, most of them peaceful. You know, um, I saw some folks getting thrown into a paddy wagon, you know, that kind of thing. You know, you would hope that the public property destruction wouldn't happen. And, you know, you, there, there's obviously some, some cross purposes probably in, in a lot of this that we're seeing. Um, uh, on the other hand, the reaction from the authorities needs to also come into some perspective. So. I mean, what a mess, uh, you know, one mess to the next. And that, that's what America 2020 is like right now. And, you know, hats off to the businesses that can kind of navigate all this, this you know, trouble and, and people like us who can kind of try and make sense of it. So, Brett, you know, C stores have, have often led um, supermarkets in certain things, especially in prepared foods um, and doing that. Uh, your, your new piece about self-serve beverage options are back. Tell us about that. Yeah, so it, it really differs per region. And, and I wouldn't say self-serve beverage options are 100% back. So uh, to kind of backtrack a little bit, in, in mid-March, when all of this with the coronavirus was really taking its toll, um, convenience store chains, one by one, halted their self-serve options, and that includes coffee bars, fountain beverage stations, and roller grills. Uh, and they either shut these operations down completely, operators did, or they pivoted to clerk serve. So the customer comes in, and their beverage or their roller grill hot dog is given to them by an employee at the store. So that's what it's been like over the last couple months. 
Over the last two weeks, though, things have changed a little bit on the East Coast. Wawa, obviously, they're a really famous convenience store chain. They officially reopened self-serve coffee bars and fountain machines at about 60, 60 locations throughout Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia. So that's all of their states of operations besides Delaware and Florida. Uh, they did add some new safety measures during this reopening phase, like uh, providing tissue paper to cover pour handles on the coffee and wrapping stirs. And they did say though that customers, if they're uncomfortable with this, they still have the option for these options to be clerk served, which is good to know. Um, and Wawa did tell us CSP that they plan on expanding this service into other areas in the coming weeks. So while I was doing this, um, a chain that we follow called Clark's Pump and Shop, they're a chain of about 70 convenience stores in Kentucky, Ohio, Virginia, and Florida. Uh, they told me just this week that they've started reopening some of their self-serve beverage options and roller grills in a few stores. And then Little General Convenience Stores, which operates more than 100 stores in Ohio, Virginia, West Virginia, said they're also on pace to reopen their self-serve beverages, not the roller grill yet. So it's happening back. Uh, it is coming back slowly. We haven't seen, you know, companies like 7-Eleven or Circle K, the, the giant convenience store chains really catch on to these yet. Um, bottom line though, consumer habits are, they, they have surely changed from all of this. Um, and when all of this is done and we don't know when that's going to be, um, these operations will look different in convenience stores. And that is roller grill, coffee, beverages, fountain beverages. Um, operators are just not sure how yet, but things will look different. So Brett, what about Sheets? Because Sheets has really, over the past few years, focused on food, uh, focused on eating in, focused on food service, upgrading their, their C stores. Uh, what, are you, what, if anything, are you hearing from folks like Ryan Sheets? Sure. Uh, Sheets has been really on top of, alongside a lot of other major convenience store chains with uh, food donations. I think just the other day they closed out an initiative they were doing where they raised um, over half a million dollars for food donation. Oh, that's great. In terms of them opening up their, their beverage bars and their coffee bars and their roller grills, uh, there's no word on that yet, whether they've done it or not. So John, you, you have a great piece of uh, probably one of the best ones out there about Ira Kress, who's Giant Foods' new president. He started out as a part-time bag boy or, or cashier, I guess. Tell us about Ira, and, and should we be excited about this move? Yeah, well, Ira's actually been in place for uh, about 11 and a half months as president on an interim basis, and just last week was named uh, president of, of Giant Food. You know, a, a couple things. One, Ira was a charming guy. Uh, a great interview and um, uh, it told, a, told a, a great story. Yeah, he was a, a part-time college student uh, studying criminal justice and, and had hoped to be a policeman uh, when he was working at a giant store in, in Maryland and uh, eventually uh, got into a training program there, was in operations and uh, human resources and labor relations back to operations and, and uh, now president after Gordon Reed was moved over to Stop and Shop. Uh, you know, the, what I'd say about Giant is, you know, it, it, uh, obviously, Phil, you, you'll remember this. They, they were a giant of uh, Washington, D.C. back in an era where there wasn't quite as much competition for uh, food there. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Metro Washington, a, a fast growing, wealthy market, uh, lots of competition there, right? You, you've got you know, a, a two horse race with Safeway and, uh, you know, has become Walmart, has become Aldi, has become Trader Joe's, has become uh, Target, um, Harris Teeter is there now. I mean, it's a tremendously difficult market and Giant Landover, the, the company uh, for a market leader really being kind of been battered around by circumstances over the years, uh, first with Ahold losing its uh, uh, getting into financial trouble. They integrated it with Stop and Shop, which kind of lost a lot of the momentum they had. And so Ira talked about, um, uh, you know, the positive changes since uh, his predecessor, Gordon Reed's been there. And uh, Ahol Delhaye's merger kind of set the brand free again, and they were able to do what, they, what, what they've been able to do. He was incredibly candid about how difficult things have been during the coronavirus scandal, which uh, uh, crisis, which we talked about, uh, you know, things like, you know, how they enforce mask policies at their stores. You know, basically they ask the customers, they encourage them not to get into, uh, you know, arguments with customers. Um, 
and you, you know was were basically said you know we've had to make thousands of decisions things this thing started none of them would be ideas would be a decision that you would want to make and under any other kinds of circumstances so managing a tough situation uh, pretty well uh you know a little bit of new momentum in a brand that is big and powerful but is really grown very very slowly if at all in the last 10 years uh so interesting story out of, out of washington so john what's interesting to me is when i look at the history of giant with izzy Cohn, and i look at the history of Wallbaums um with david karen i mean these were some of the most progressive chains in the country uh led by a, a very powerful merchandiser if you would that was really very community based um, do you think that this new era, post-COVID-19, we're going to return to that? Certainly, we've seen Randy Edeker from Hy-Vee, um, other, other CEOs stepping up and having more of a public face. Do we think that that's where the direction's going to go? I, I mean, I guess it would depend on the, on the circumstances, but, you know, certainly... Um, you know, I, I would say that uh, locally controlled brands is the way to go, even though national scale and, and financial might is important. So, uh, you know, I think it's really instructive to look at Ajo Del Hayes. They, you know, almost all their banners uh, have been improving. Uh, and, and a lot of that is tied to the fact that they've got people very close to them that are making the decisions about what they merchandise and what things cost them, and how to talk to the customers in those regions. Uh, you know, as opposed to maybe in the past where, you know, the Ajo USA brands, you know, the same thing in, in Boston was the same thing in Washington, and it didn't really work probably as well as they had drawn it up. Um, and you know what, uh, uh, smart merchandisers and, and, and uh, you know, people like that are always in, um, in need in, in any business. So, you know, the fact that you've got visionary smart people running things is, is going to help. Jen, what smart retailers do you have? Because you have mostly chains there, right? Do you have any strong independence with a, with a real clear voice? Well, we have, uh, you know, and we, we do, we have very small independence, but, um, you know, Sprouts is sort of an interesting um, story because I, I just last week, I believe, wrote a story on, uh, based on Sprouts' uh, recent strategic decisions call. And it, Jack Sinclair, their CEO, has, you know, has interest. He doesn't like being called a grocer. He doesn't want Sprouts to be a grocer. They are really uh, aiming to go back to their, you know, their roots as as an authentic farmers market, and scale back their store size, which had gotten kind of pricey. And like he thought the fixtures were too modern, and um, you know, just going back to that kind of smaller store, twenty to twenty five thousand square feet. Um, and they've, they've found that their, their shoppers prefer that. They actually sell more, um, they have higher sales numbers in the smaller stores than they do in their more expansive locations. Interesting, and, and Jen, you're in the middle of writing a story about plant-based, right? Actually finished that one too. That published. <laughs> oh yeah? I didn't realize it, it posted, I gotta catch up. So, so what's, yeah. the, what's the highlight on plant-based growth right now? We've obviously seen the numbers. Uh, from Nielsen that has shown during COVID-19 that more plant-based um, beef alternatives um, have have been rising in sales. We just heard, I think it was yesterday, that Impossible Foods is going direct to consumers. Uh, what, give us the 101 on plant-based. Yeah, so the Good Food Institute uh, just came out with this study where they sort of ranked the top grocery chains in terms of their product assortment in the plant-based categories. Um, you know, it's a $5 billion market right now um, being led by a dairy, alternative dairy and meat. Dairy is number one, meat's number two. Um, and they were just looking at, it was, you know, interesting to see, uh, actually Sprouts CEO mentioned that as a point of differentiation for like their frozen food aisle that that he's like, you walk down our frozen food aisle, it doesn't look like anybody else's. It's really focused on plant-based, vegan, veg vegetarian. Um, they weren't one of the, the grocers listed in the, uh, I shouldn't have called them a grocer. They weren't one of the farmer's markets listed. <laughs> in the study. Um, but uh, Wegmans got the highest in terms of overall product assortment. Uh, Whole Foods was, was, 
got a nod for having the strongest food service plant-based assortment. Uh, and then Whole Foods and uh, Kroger owned uh, King Supers, which is what Kroger mm -hmm. is in, in Denver, um, got high marks for having a broad product assortment of plant-based. So I want to go to Kat and Brett. Kat, why don't you start? But you, you're, you're in Meat City. I mean, when I, when I look at Chicago, it's beef, beef, beef. What's going on, uh, Kat, in supermarkets and plant-based in Chicago? And then, Brett, is there anything going on in plant-based when it comes to sea stores, Kat? Well, yeah. Um, you know, we meat sales we've talked about, you know, for several weeks now are, are skyrocketing. People are really returning uh, meat as the protein back to the center of their plate. Um, and that's not to say that plant-based isn't growing as well because it is. Um, and there was an interesting point that you had brought up, Phil, about the um, impossible going direct to consumers. And we have seen several other uh, manufacturers or, or uh, suppliers do this. And I was just kind of curious, if this is something that's going to you know, continue, like Pepsi now has, I think, two consumer yeah. um, websites where people can buy direct from them. And, you know, is this something that grocers need to start worrying about? Or, you know, are they trying to cut out the, the middleman, so to speak? Or is this just, you know, kind of a flash in the pan, something to um, get us through in this pandemic? I was just kind of curious what everybody else's thoughts were on that. Yeah, well, I'll start on that. But I, I also want, Brett, you to weigh in on plant-based in, in C-stores. Uh, but I am hearing from more and more brands that want to go direct to consumer. Whether or not they're making any money, that's another story. Uh, but yeah, everything from yogurts to, to protein powders to meats. Um, I, I keep on hearing on the radio this farmer, and I forgot her name, uh, but she uh, she's selling via radio direct to consumer uh, beef, pork, and I think chicken. I think it's called Farmers something. I, I'll, I'll get the name for, for next week and I'll post it on, on our Facebook feed. Uh, but, you know, Jen, John, what do you think about direct to consumer? And then Brett, I'm not letting you off the hook as it relates to plant-based and sea stores. Yeah, direct to consumer, every, every little bit helps. Um, and, you know, although a lot of the kind of the, the digital native brands that got a lot of buzz, not all of them uh, succeeded. A lot of them wound up getting absorbed by bigger companies. Um, but uh, I think the, the, the pandemic put a, uh, obviously put a premium on uh, uh, convenience for consumers and perceived safer options. And I think everything online looked better to customers for the time being. Um, uh, not really sure how much of that's going to last, but every little bit helps. Jen, your thoughts? Yeah, I think particularly in meat, you know, we're hearing all these stories of um, farmers having to, to kill off hogs or cattle um, because there's no place for it to go. I took a drive last weekend through some sort of farming areas in Colorado and I saw multiple signs of farmers with signs out on the street that said, we sell meat, you know, hmm. come, <laughs> come on in and buy it yeah. from us. Interesting. Um, and and you know, you're not in farm country. No, well, th I mean, this, I was, I drove out of the city for this. Got it. it wasn't. Farmers. So, um, so one one note of correction from Facebook. Um, our friend Leah McGrath um, is correcting me, uh, which I always depend on Leah to do. Uh, the Roebling website is not Roebling.com. It is Roebling.io. So Roebling.io. If you're interested in that free tool about reopening. And so Brett, you're on the spot. Um, both of of what we're talking about for direct to consumer, what impact that might have on, on C-stores. But first, uh, plant-based in the C-store, does it exist? Is it growing? Is it a factor? Yeah, it definitely is. Over the past year, I'd say year and change, convenience store chains have started offering plant-based items, especially uh, specifically plant-based burgers more than anything. Uh, hmm. There's Sheets, Get-Go, which is the C-store division of Giant Eagle. Uh, they those are to name a few and many others. They've brought in plant-based burgers, uh, the Perfect Burger, Dr. Prager's, the Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger, and they've had raving results. Uh, specifically during COVID-19, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, as you guys have all said, we've heard about the beef shortages and the meat shortages. Um, a lot of operators 
have told us that their customers are doing a lot of their their meat and produce shopping in their stores um, just because, you know, smaller foot space and they're not surrounded by tons and tons of people at a time if they walk into their C store. Um, so whether or not the, the plant-based items are, are outpacing traditional beef at this moment in C store, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent positive, but uh, in general, the, the plant-based trend in C stores, it's for real. And uh, it's, it's going to continue. So I think one of the things we see in C stores generally, sorry, Bill, is that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the food trends kind of hit there first and, and then kind of dribble over to retail. So this could be one of those areas. I guess, Brent, I'm, I'm surprised to hear about the huge success. Um, I don't think, with certain exceptions, Wawa and Sheets, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, but I don't think of the typical C-store consumer as somebody who's going to try um, Impossible Foods or, or Beyond Meat. I'm obviously wrong. What, what do you think is behind that? Sure. Uh, there, there's a lot of different things behind it, Phil. Um, one, there is a, a reason to eat healthier. Healthy eating in convenience stores ha is nothing new. It's It's been one of the hottest trends for the last few years. Um, but obviously, plant-based meats, you know, there, there's a health thing with it, why a lot of people want to do it. And uh, a lot of the, the fad diet trends have really hit C-stores. So a lot of keto, vegetarian, vegan items are, are arriving in the space as well. Um, and, and a lot of the core consumers for convenience stores are, are, are younger people, increasingly younger people, and they wanna see those new food trends hitting the space. Um, so I would definitely say that, and, and operators just wanna bring in a, a more diverse set of customers. And obviously, you know, the if you're not insanely familiar with the C-store space, you, you kind of have a perception of what that area looks like and the types of foods they offer. You know, Roller Grill, for example, as I was talking about before, is right synonymous with convenience store right, right? um but, but i love those brown hot dogs <laughs> you know hey you know what the, you know the, and you know if there's talk about plant-based roller grill items coming in okay. coming in too so convenience stores i would say more than anything they're they're trying to break that perception that a lot of folks have about what food they offer i mean you see in, in sheets if you go to pennsylvania sheets and wawa uh people love it there they they have sure. fans they they are dedicated consumers of going to eat, eat at those locations. Um, so I'd say they're setting a good example of how the industry as a whole wants customers to, to think of food in C-stores. And just to go back to plant-based to wrap it up, I mean, their operators are really trying to bring these offerings in to tell customers, hey, we got these too. And that's, they know that people are looking for those options specifically. Got it. And uh, it's it's the end of COVID-19, which means it's time for Jen to give us some good news. Yay, we have twice the good news this time. <laughs> um, HEB and Unilever just uh, donated more than 10,000 beauty and grooming bags to frontline hospital workers, which was kind of a fun pick-me-up. I'm sure they appreciate it. Yeah, uh, that, that's great. And also, um, so we've got a question, um, and Brett, this comes to you before we end, and we're monitoring CSP's Facebook, Winsight's Facebook, Supermarket Guru's Facebook, which is why I keep on looking all over the place. Uh, question, Brett, what is the actual per store day movement on meatless versus meat products in convenience from Frank White? Uh, do you have any idea off the top of your head? It's a great question. I do not, have, I do not know off the top of my head. Which means you have to be back on Thursday with that answer so we can give it to Frank. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I can't answer that. Thank you, everybody, for joining us um, right here on Winsight Live. Uh, we'll be back Thursday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific, 12.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 11.30 Central. And in the meantime, please be sure to look at our ar archive versions on Winsight Grocery Business Facebook and dot com and supermarket guru facebook and dot com and we'll see you on thursday and be safe <laughs>